Welcome to or welcome back to my channel and thank you for joining me here again today. Last week we spoke about the Mori Mole monster and if you haven't heard that I will link it up here for you. So what I like to do once a month is to try and do an unsolved murder. But I thought today I would spice it up a little bit and instead of doing an unsolved murder, I will do a countdown of three of some of the most disturbing missing persons cases or the last picture or sinister video that was taken of them before they disappeared and the creepy backstory behind these photos. If you would like to see this countdown, then let's get into it. This missing person story talks about Tara Calico. Tara was born on the 28th of February 1969. So let me set the scene for this missing person story. So on the day that Tara went missing, she was riding around on her bike and she was riding around the area of New Mexico. She would usually take this route. It wasn't a new route that she was taking and she would usually go along this route with her mother and her mother's name is Patty. But one day Tara and Patty were riding around this route and Patty said that she felt really uncomfortable. She said that she felt that someone was watching them and when they got home from their ride around this route, Patty said to Tara, listen, the next time we go out, I think that you should use pepper spray or something on you that you could possibly defend yourself with. So like I said, on the day that Tara went missing, she was riding around this New Mexico route that she had ridden so many times. But this particular day, she went alone. Her mom, I think, was busy with something else or Tara just wanted to ride along this route because she was going to see her boyfriend and they were going to play tennis together at around half past 12 in the afternoon. So Tara got on her bike, took her Walkman CD player with her, and she rode off. I don't think I gave a date, but this all took place in 1988 in September. So Tara is still happily going along this route, and witnesses see her, they've seen her plenty of times go down this road. All of a sudden, these witnesses say that they see a really light colored car, which had like blacked out or tinted windows. And Tara kind of went around the bend, and that was the last that anyone saw of her. They've never seen Tara Calico again. Obviously, she never arrived for her tennis match or her tennis time with her boyfriend. And she never returned home when she said she would. So her mother got worried. She tried to walk the route that Tara went down. And she did find her CD Walkman on the route. But she didn't find her bike. So Patty called the police. The police came. They did an investigation. They talked to witnesses. And witnesses did mention, like I said earlier, that they saw a light-colored vehicle following her with tinted out windows. The police were trying to find some evidence, they were trying to follow up on these, but there was such minimal evidence that they really couldn't go anywhere with this and soon the case went cold. Until around a year later, in 1989, police were called to a parking lot in Port St. Joe in Florida. And remember, Tara went missing in 1988 and in 1999 they got the call. When police got to the scene, they did find what the lady was talking about and they decided to call Tara's mother, Patty, to the scene to try and identify what they had found. So Patty was called and obviously her first thought went to, is Tara alive? Even if she's not alive, hopefully they found a body, any type of closure Patty was looking for. So Tara's mom is walking up to the area that the police had cordoned off. There was no body, there wasn't anything there except a single Polaroid photograph. In this photograph was a picture of a woman and a young boy who were both bound and gagged. The police asked Patty to see if they could maybe identify if it was Tara. The police thought that it was Tara, but they couldn't be sure. It wasn't their daughter. So Patty's kind of looking at this photo and she believes that it's Tara. Her mom is also kind of thinking in her head, okay, Tara may have grown. It's been a year. She's only around 19 years old. So there's still room for her to grow in her late teens. She also noticed a scar on Tara's leg that she said that she had. So with this statement from Tara's mom, Patty, they took the photo away to get officially investigated by the proper authority. And the lady who called the police to say that she identified the photograph said that she was walking to work that day. And as she walked into the like convenience stores that were alongside the parking lot, she said that she noticed a white Toyota van that was just hanging around in the parking spot where the photo was found. And she said that she looked into the van and she saw a young man who was roughly around in his 30s and he had a very, very thick moustache. And that was about all that she could identify from him. So the photo was taken first to Scotland Yard. Why? I'm not quite sure. But it was taken there and Scotland Yard said that they thought that it was Tara and they identified the photograph as definitely Tara. But then the FBI wanted to get involved and they took the photograph off Scotland Yard 
and they said that you couldn't really determine that the photograph was Tara. So we don't really know who the woman is or the little boy is in the photograph. So I'm going to show you the photograph now of who police believe is Tara. And they think that this photograph was taken in May of 1989 because the particular Polaroid batch was only made after May of 1989. So it could have only been taken then. So is it Tara? Is it not? And also, who is the little boy in the photo? So I'm going to show you that photo now and you let me know if you think it's Tara down below. This next story takes us to the big blue ocean and also on a beautiful Disney cruise line. Now, I love the ocean and I love to do anything in water or just anything like that. I've never been on a cruise line. I've never been on one of those big ships that take you around to different places. I don't know if I want to go on the ship now after this story, but let's get into this next missing persons case. So Rebecca Corrin was born on the 11th of March, 1987 in Chester, England. She was a family oriented girl. She loved being with her family, but she also loved adventure and being physically active. And she was just on the ball. She was just constantly doing things and just wanting to keep her mind really busy. So while Rebecca was a teenager, she did enroll in the British Army Cadets, which I'm not sure if they get paid. They may do, but I'm not sure. But basically cadets do training. They get trained up to do basic kind of tasks and basic survival stuff. So they'll learn how to shoot, they'll learn how to abseil, they'll be kept physically active quite a lot. And they'll also just learn really, really important life skills. So remember Rebecca did that as a teenager. Then when she left school, she wanted to do something that was also in her family. So she went to work at a zoo that her family had worked at before. But this wasn't really hitting the nail on the head for Rebecca. So she left the zoo and she went to Plymouth University to study. And here she studied sports science. So after studying, she did odd jobs and she moved around a little bit, but she was still not finding things that she wanted to do. So when she was in London one day, she actually went for an interview with Disney for a position that allowed her to work on their cruise ship. And Rebecca got the job. She was hired and she went to Florida for a couple of weeks to do some training on these cruise ships. I'm not sure if you know, but when you work on these big ships, you're basically gone for a couple of months or a month or two and then you come back for a month or two and like and you keep going back and forth like that and you basically get told where you need to go so whatever country whatever city disney is operating in or whatever company is operating in you go to that cruise line but on one of these cruises after rebecca had done everything she was told that her next cruise was going to be with a disney wonder which was based in los angeles and she was happy she went on the disney wonder she just went on for a couple months and then she went home like for a month and then she came back onto the disney wonder but on her second trip on the Disney Wonder is where things started to go haywire. So as always, Rebecca would keep in touch with her family, either via Facebook or Skype. She would either message or video call every day. And on the 21st of March, 2011, so a couple weeks after her birthday, she was on Skype or on Facebook like normal with her family. And then she said she's going to go and she'll talk to them again tomorrow. So nothing strange. Everything's normal. And this call happened around six weeks after she was already on the cruise ship. But the next day when Rebecca said she was going to call, she didn't. Rebecca also didn't turn up for her ship. So her friends and the other crew members on the ship decided to look for her. She wasn't in her room. She wasn't anywhere on the ship. She wasn't in the staff pool. She wasn't running on the track. And she also wasn't responding to any calls over the like intercom and staff PA system. So the crew members decided to look at the CCTV footage because apparently Disney has like CCTV all over their ship. And they said that they did see her on CCTV at around half past five in the morning. But then one of the crew members who was busy on the other side of the ship came to this group that was trying to investigate where Rebecca was. And she said to them that she did see Rebecca, but she saw Rebecca at 3 a.m. the morning that she went missing. And what she noticed was that Rebecca fell overboard. So how could Rebecca have been seen on footage, like time stamped, at around half past five, quarter to six in the morning. But then a crew member also said that she saw her at three o'clock the morning and that she went overboard. Why didn't you report it? Why didn't someone say, oh, my crew member fell overboard? Oh, well. So the US Coast Guard was sent out as well as the Mexican Navy. And they followed the exact route that the Disney Wonder had taken that night. So they went along the deep water to see if Rebecca was there or any type of evidence was there, but they found nothing. Sadly, the investigations were done very poorly as well. A detective from Los Angeles was sent over to investigate and did board the ship. 
and he said that he was going to do investigations over a couple of weeks like he'll be there for quite a while but he only took one day to do investigations over the whole ship he didn't investigate or talk to any of the passengers he didn't talk to anyone that could have been witnesses that were not crew members so he only spoke to a handful of crew members and he didn't even speak to Rebecca's friend. We spoke to maybe one or two. He also left the ship, like I said, after one day and said, oh, he found nothing. There's no evidence here. And when journalists got hold of the story and they managed to get on the ship as well to talk to the crew members, the crew members did spill some of the beans about the Disney wonder. They said that Disney knew a lot more than they were letting on. The crew members said that there was CCTV absolutely everywhere. It wasn't like you could walk out of your room without being on CCTV. So if you went to the kitchen quickly, you would be on CCTV. You went just to peer over the side of the boat, you would be on CCTV. I also read somewhere, and I'm not sure if it's true, but I thought I read or heard somewhere that Disney has like these cameras on the sides of the ship where if something big or person falls over the side that a sensor is like switched on and an alarm goes off that something has fallen overboard. So I'm not sure if that's true, but if it is, then why did those sensors not go off? So now let's get into some of the theories that surround Rebecca Coriam. Some say that she was in a relationship and her relationship was going quite sour. Her girlfriend and her weren't getting on very well and she was depressed and having really bad thoughts. And they thought that she maybe threw herself over because of this depression that was heavily growing on her. Another theory was that Rebecca had gone jogging around the ship because it was kind of like an athletics track. They went around some of the areas of the ship that you could jog and crew members said that those walls that surrounded the jogging lane around the ship was very short and they thought that because the waves were so rough that night that maybe a wave like washed Rebecca over and she had actually gone back over the railing with the wave but quite a few people believe that Rebecca Karim was thrown off the ship and the CCTV that has been leaked shows Rebecca very very distressed constantly crying, looking over her shoulder. She just seems very uncomfortable. And if Disney does know what happened to Rebecca, they are the only ones who have the CCTV. And if the crew members are telling the truth, they would have caught what happened to her because there's CCTV everywhere. I don't know. I'm going to show you some of the still images that were taken from the CCTV footage. And you let me know what you think happened to this case down below. So this next story of this unsolved case, and I say this because there were bodies that were found, but this story has intrigued me since the first time that I've heard it. I think maybe this case hits a bit closer to home because I've had the privilege of being able to go overseas with one of my best friends. And we've been on places or gone to areas where we haven't told anyone. We've just decided, let's just do something and let's just go. But yeah, so this story really puts things in perspective. But anyway, enough babbling, Nicole. Let's get into this next case, which is the unsolved case of Chris Kramer's and Lazan Fruin. I might be saying those names really incorrectly, and I'm very sorry for that. So Lazan or Lazan Fruin was born on September 24th, 1991, and she was born in Amersfoort, Netherlands. Chris Kramer's was born on August 9th, 1992, and she was also born in Amersfoort, Netherlands. So Lazan or Lazan, who was around 22 at the time, she was described as energetic, happy, optimistic, intelligent, and just full of life. She was so passionate about things, especially nature, and she was a very active volleyball player. Chris, who was around 21 at the time, she was described as open, welcoming, creative, and very, very responsible. Like, if things were told to do this way, she would do it that way. So both girls had grown up in the Netherlands, like I said before. So Lazan had graduated from the University of Denver with a degree in applied sciences, and she had graduated the year before. So Chris had just graduated university, and Chris's specialization was in art education at the University of Utrecht. And I'm sorry if I'm saying that wrong. So now that the girls are both fresh graduates, they had completed their degrees, they're tired, they just want to relax. They decided to go to Panama to celebrate Chris's graduation, as well as to just get out and explore and to be one with nature kind of thing. So before leaving to Panama, Chris and Lazan decided to work really hard. 
they moved in together. They only lived in one little room, so they were paying very little towards their living. They worked at restaurants and cafes, wherever they could get money, fund their trip to Panama. So they both worked really hard for around six months, and then they were able to afford their trip to Panama. So this trip wasn't only to celebrate Chris's graduation. They also wanted to go on this trip so that they could learn Spanish, as well as volunteer around the children's homes and just be there culturally, as well as to help with any charities that they could. So Chris and Azan arrived for six month vacation to Panama on March 15th 2014. They went around Panama for around two weeks and then on March 29th they arrived in a small town called Boquet or Boqueta where they were going to stay with a local family so that they could volunteer and help with the children around the area. On April 1st they then decided it was a day off they were going to go for a hike around the area and they took the family dog with them. They wanted to go to this beautiful forest that surrounded a volcano which was called Baru Forest. So Chris and Azan did keep in touch with their family via Facebook as often as they could. So before they headed out to this hike, they first had lunch with two Dutch men and then they went on their way. So obviously nothing was heard from the girls throughout the day. They thought they were just hiking, but the owners of the local family that they were staying with became really, really worried when the dog that Chris and Azan went off with during the day came home by himself. The Zahn's parents stopped receiving text messages, which like I said, both girls were communicating with their families in some way every day. Then on the morning of April 2nd, the Zahn and Chris had organized a local guide to meet them at a specific spot because they wanted to really get to know the area, not just the touristy parts, but the deep places that no one really went to. The local guide thought that maybe they just got lost or they forgot about it, so he left. Then on April 3rd, the police started to do aerial investigations and also began asking local residents about anything that they had seen. Then, around April 6th, Chris and Azan's parents had both arrived in Panama. Then, on the same day, the cadaver dogs and just normal police dogs started going down into the area where Chris and Azan were last seen. Detectives from the Netherlands also arrived in Panama and they decided to do a hectic 10-day search of the area. But sadly, nothing came of the search and the girls were still missing. Then, around 10 weeks after the girls had first gone missing, a local lady who lived in the area brought a backpack that she believed to be one of the girls to the police station in the area. This lady said that she found it in a rice paddy near her village of Alto Ramiro in the Bocas de Toro region. This lady said that she was 100% sure that this backpack was not there the day before because she tends to the rice paddies almost every day. Inside this backpack, it contained two pairs of sunglasses, around $83 in cash, Lazan's passport, a water bottle, Azan's camera, two bras, and both Chris and Azan's phone, all packed up, dry, and in good condition. So when police decided to go through Chris and Azan's phones, it showed that the girls went hiking, and a few hours after they started the hike, one of the girls dialed 112, which is apparently the international emergency number. The first distress call had been made just hours after they started their hike. One was from Chris's iPhone, and this was around half past four, around 20 to five. And shortly after that, Lazan then called the emergency number from her phone, and that was around 10 to five. Unfortunately, there was no reception in the area that they were hiking in, so none of the emergency calls actually went through, except for one call that did make it through to the emergency department, and that was on April 3rd. And it looked like the emergency call center did answer the phone, but then everything was static and they couldn't hear anything, so they put the phone down. After April 5th, Lazan's phone had become really flat. Around the next morning, the phone was completely dead. There was no battery life left at all. Chris's iPhone would be used to try and make emergency calls. The phone was turned off, turned on constantly to try and save battery life. But after the 6th of April, there were multiple attempts to try and unlock the phone, but the passcode was constantly incorrect. One report also showed that between 7th and the 10th of April, there were 77 attempts to call emergency services with Chris's iPhone. Then on the 11th of April, the phone was turned on again at 10 to 11 in the morning and then it was turned off for the last time at 11.56 the same morning. So when detectives went through Lazan's camera, they noticed that they started their hike on April 1st and they had taken a particular trail that looked over the continental divide and somehow they may have gotten lost but they wandered into the wilderness just hours before they started calling emergency services. When taking these photos and looking through the camera police didn't find anything unusual but then on the 8th of April 2011 90 flash photos were taken between 1 o'clock in the morning and 4 o'clock in the morning and these photos that police were looking through were photos of a deep jungle it was pitch black outside and the girls obviously couldn't see anything and they may have been using this 
as a way to see whatever they were looking at. So because they found the backpack in a certain area, they started to look within that area specifically. And when they did, they did find Chris's denim shorts. Some say that her shorts were zipped up, folded really neatly and placed on top of a rock. Other sources say that her pants or her shorts were not found neatly on a rock. They were found floating in the river. Then two months after the girls had gone missing and all these searches had been done and close to where the local lady found the backpack, a pelvis and a boot were found which still contained a foot inside the boot. Then soon after they found 33 scattered bones around the area which was around the same riverbank that the jeans and the backpack were found. Then DNA testing was done on these bones and they did confirm that it was Chris Kramer and Lazar Fron. But weirdly it it seemed that Chris Kramer's bones had been bleached and forensic pathologists did look really closely at these bones. They went under a microscope and said that there were no scratches on the bones from an animal or even natural scratches at all. The bones were perfectly like kept but they were bleed. So now I'm going to show you some photos of that night in the jungle. There is one photo where it seems to be Lazan's hair. Let me know what you think. These photos are quite disturbing but I will show you them now. That is the three unsolved cases or weird disappearances that happened and nothing has come from. Let me know what you think of this type of unsolved case down below, if you like it or not. And thank you for joining me again. Stay safe out there and I'll see you again next week. Bye.